And that was quite in contrast to the way I was brought up. Like I was very much, you know, raised with the idea that certain things are not for you. They're very nice for the world, but it's not something that you will get involved with. And I guess since I've freed myself from that perspective, it's like I can't say no to anything. <laughs> I mean. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute whatever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So Rivka, thank you so much for joining me on The No Show. Um, I'm really, really pleased to have you uh, for many reasons um, that, you know, the audience will, will shortly find out. But um, let us first start by, you know, a little bit of a background about you and, and how you sort of got into science and, and become a, became a woman of science. <laughs> Um, it's a it's quite a long story and I'm going to try and tell it quickly. Um, I grew up very, very, very religious, um, Orthodox Jewish, and I went to a school um, where the focus was definitely not on education and career. And in fact, it actively discouraged women from attending university and made it difficult, like you needed a UCAS form, you know, which is supported by your school. And um, this is not what happened in my in my school. Um, and it's, it's a really long story how, how I got into science. I, I had no idea what to do with my life. Um, the, the only thing I knew was that I wanted to be financially independent. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know how to go about that I, I went to a career service that I found in the yellow pages this was in the 90s and um, they had a computer there and it asked you loads of questions and you just answered all the questions like maybe 50 questions and at the end it tells you what to be and it said um, do forensic science and I I had spoke to a couple of people about this and I discovered that I might have to like you know look at severed heads or crime scenes and things like that and and that sounded really terrifying to me um and then the next choice is they give me three choices the next choice was food technologist and uh the woman there explained to me you know it's the it's the scientists who figure out how to stop the cone in a cornetto from going soggy when it has ice cream inside <laughs> and that's it did sound attractive i have to say but um because of my religion, where there were a lot of restrictions around food, I was a bit worried that if I go into a career involving food, I'll get myself into all kinds of trouble. And it just seemed unwise. Um, so number three option was uh, biochemistry. So I, I didn't really know what it was, but I figured it, it seemed safe. And, you know, it seemed like it had options at the end of it. And and what they told me there, and this was really my plan for a long time, is that if you do biochemistry, then afterwards you can train as a chartered accountant and you can be an accountant. And then you'll, you know, you'll have a safe income and life will be good. So that was my, my plan. Um, they told me that for A-levels, I must do biology, chemistry and physics. And um, I went to see the head teacher. Um, most girls in my school were leaving at 16. And only two of us wanted to stay to the sixth form. And um, the headmaster said uh, that I could learn chemistry and biology as long as I would take the, the top end of the syllabus first, because there were two girls in the lower sixth who were doing it in, in the oh, upper sixth. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And anyway, it's a bit of a long story, but I got there eventually and it's, I did biochemistry. It's, it's fascinating to see that you, know, <laughs> you literally had to sort of. <laughs> Like, I mean, it goes, this links to really sort of why you did the arts project. Um, 
which obviously yeah. for, for our listeners, um, you're going to explain shortly, but the arts project seems like such a fascinating thing where you bring scientists and artists and you get them to work together. But in, in sort of starting on early in your life, it seems like because there was sort of such little resource or a lack of resources in terms of what you could, what, what potential sort of avenues you can go down and the diversity of, of research, the research world and, you know, what kind of research you can get into. It, it, feel, it sounds like you felt like at that point in your life, you could have been one of three things, either forensic <laughs> scientist or, you know, like um, a food technologist or, or um, a biochemist. Or, so it, it's, it's really interesting to, to hear this perspective, but is, did this play a part in you doing the arts project? I think so, actually. Um, the truth is that I, I think um, that I was quite lucky with the way things went for me because I have the feeling that if I had had a really good secondary education, I probably would have studied English at university because that's my real passion. But I've got so caught up with English, you know, just from reading a million novels. Um, I've even got hugely involved in academic English since becoming a science academic. And that I mean, again, that's another story how that happened, but it just came from my natural enthusiasm and my involvement in talking to all kinds of different people that I've met over the years and just, you know, taking every opportunity that came my way. And that was quite in contrast to the way I was brought up. Like I was very much, you know, raised with the idea that certain things are not for you. They're very nice for the world, but it's not something that you will get involved with. And I guess since I've freed myself from that perspective, it's like I can't say no to anything. <laughs> I mean, that sounds kind of bad, but what I mean is that there are so many opportunities open in the world. So, so what I think is if I'd done English, it would have been very, very hard to get as involved as I am in science okay. as a side project. Whereas as a scientist, I have very successfully managed to get involved in the world of poetry, the world of literature, and the world of art. And that makes me so, so happy. Um, but I do not like the idea that you are expected to choose one or the other, because I think so much, I mean, even, um, so I told you about a, a scientific paper that we published, which involved a whole variety of techniques, which together gave us an answer that we would not have been able to get by using just one of those techniques. And I think that's true, however extremely interdisciplinary you get, you know, that like you can take a subject that is just so far removed from another subject, but if you get two people from those different fields chatting, you can guarantee that that's gonna be a really exciting and stimulating conversation. It may not be that they actually find something they can practically do together, but I think, you know, the more you chat, the more, like ideas get opened up and avenues get explored. And to me, like there is no, um, there's virtually nobody that I have a chat with where I don't come away and think, oh, you know, it's just something a bit different. It's, it's amazing. I think that's such an amazing sort of that, that um, character of inquisitiveness is, is something that in, from our perspective, doing the no show and working with young people all the time, um, we find that, they sort of um they get inquisitiveness almost be out of them uh, yeah and this is what you're what you sort of explained is that you were passionate about english and novels and stories and poetry and that sort of stuff but you're always going to be passionate about that but you're the fact that you got into the sciences and you got into a field that you would have otherwise not got into just now allows you to find opportunities for learning and and sort of um, doing this multidisciplinary approach to, to research that informs your research much more um, mu than any uh, than any sort of narrow focus. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think it is becoming more and more appreciated, actually. Like there are a lot of really cool things now that bring together very different types of people and different ways of thinking and it's always a positive experience in 
you know, as as far as I can tell, like we we have this really cool thing at King's uh, where I work, um, called Science Gallery London, which is uh, it's an amazing space. They have all these exhibitions that are about, um, you know, they're on themes like really popular themes around, um, you know, things that people are thinking at the moment, like addiction. Um, they they had one. Um, well, they they. It's, it's a really fantastic program, but it brings, it, it, it does it in a really unconventional way. It brings a lot of different types of artists. The, the things that you see in that exhibition space, like every single one of them, is just, whoa, you know, really gets you thinking or really gets you like grossed out or, you know, whatever it is, but something that provokes a reaction of some kind. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, when I first started doing interdisciplinary stuff when I was a scientist probably mostly when I when I was a postdoc like before I, I had my own lab uh, a lot of people advised me like senior scientists said to me when you apply for jobs you keep you should keep that side of your life quiet because people don't want to think that you're easily distractible people don't want to think um, that you're not fully focused on your scientific career mm -hmm. and I cannot tell you how much that perspective has changed like even you know in the 12 or 13 years since since people were saying that sort of thing to me now it's like it's called impact you know what real effect can your work have on the world around you like how um you know don't be in this tiny niche of you know deep understanding of a really really complicated thing like that is very important really important but you don't you know you need to be able to share that and you need to be able to share it on a few levels like on a level that others can you know get involved and become uh, as technical as you but also in a way that as as you have said on this podcast like the everyone is funding this it's the taxpayers money and you want to understand how how that's being spent like i often actually a lot of the machines that i use uh, i'm not a huge huge expert with but I know how to use them to get an important result that will influence uh, the way that we think about a particular biological question or something that we are trying to find out uh, an answer to. Um, and I often say it's a bit like, you know, watching TV, like ev everyone knows how to watch TV and everyone enjoys watching TV and achieves, you know, their goal by turning on their TV and watching it. Um, but very few people would actually be able to make a TV. Um, that that doesn't matter because somebody knew how to make a TV. They made great TVs, yeah. and we can all watch it now and benefit from it. So it's the same with a lot of really amazing scientific machinery. You know, my research is biophysics, and the idea of that is you know machinery and ideas that were first developed within physics now being applied to biological problems. So I can take a particular spectrometer or a particular kind of machine. And I can use it in the same way that you would watch TV. Like you need to understand certain things about it, how to turn it on, how to adjust various things. Um, and also quite importantly, how to interpret your results. Um, but there are lots of ways to, you know, this is becoming more and more egalitarian, like techniques are becoming a lot less specialized and a lot more available to regular scientists. And so there's a lot of potential um, to, you know, to use something that in the past would have been too, too hard because you had to have a lot of deep technical knowledge, whereas now you can use it a lot more accessibly. Mm -hmm. I, I think you, you touch on so many things that um, are really interesting. And one of the things that you've mentioned, um, and obviously let, let us sort of explain to the audience a little bit more about the, the arts project that you did. So you essentially got, um, a bunch of scientists and a bunch of artists and you put them all together in a room and made the artists paint the scientists um and they in doing so they you know had conversations with each other they explored each other's um sort of fields and the important thing that you mentioned um is that we have this sort of idea that artists and scientists have two completely different lives and different approaches and you have two different images of who they are and there's a level of suspicion so so talk me about that and uh, talk me through that and 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 about what you saw happening when you got these two groups of people together 
yeah. Um, I think for, yeah, part of the motivation for the project to begin with was this idea that, you know, at school we really are sent down the scientific or artistic route. And I think the UK is particularly bad in this respect. And it's, so it, it often turns out that, you know, when you get to be, I, I'd say a, a bit a bit less so for scientists, because I often find scientists who are very musical, for example, or who have, um, you know, an interest in reading or an interest in art. Like it's, it's often the case um, that you can be a scientist as your job, but you have lots and lots of artsy interests on the side, but it's quite unusual to find the other thing where, you know, you're, you're educated in arts and your job is something on the humanities side, um, but that you have a big kind of hobby or interest to do with science. I'd say it's not 100% true, obviously. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, to me, that's a, that's a real shame. I think that everybody benefits from being involved, um, you know, with people who are not exactly the same as them and talking to them and discussing stuff. So our idea was to explore common things in our way of working because I had noticed that um, a lot of my friends, uh, even if their fields were completely different, were having a very similar day to me. You know, they all had the same objectives of thinking of new ideas, um, researching their ideas, fleshing out their ideas, selling them to other people as good ideas, then applying for funding if they got their funding, project managing, um, you know, finding suitable people to help carry out the work, then refining the product, iterating the product till it's something they really are happy with, and then finding ways to spread the word about that or sell it depending on the nature of the beast. And I just thought it was interesting that although our end products were very different and our training was very different. We were really thinking along the same lines. And I thought there's got to be a benefit to, you know, talking to other people who are engaged in the same task and really getting hints from the different ways they think. I thought that would be very beneficial. Uh, and I had coincidentally met these portrait painting artists and we had been discussing possible projects we could do together. And we just had this idea to find um, people who have different influences in the scientific sphere um, to get their port portraits painted um, by the artists and then discuss, yeah, the ways that they work and like identify common ground, common misconceptions. And it was really amazing, actually, the rapport that built up. Like I think having your portrait painted, it's it's quite an intimate experience in a way because the artist is like staring at your face the whole time, and um, and you just it's weird like you're not really used to being ex explored and stared at like so intently um, as an experience because it's like not really done like it suddenly makes that acceptable like socially acceptable that someone is like peering at your cheekbone, yeah. um, and so it it does you know, it, it, it somehow creates this like trust thing and, and they, the scientists and artists had, they had great interactions. And if you watch the little films that we made, it's, it's really, really nice. And, and when we actually, when we wrote, sent the paper for peer review, um, I couldn't believe this. It, it went through a open peer review process, which means that you actually find out who the people were. This is not normally happening in science yeah. in most journals. Yeah, you don't find out, you just get this list of reviewers' comments and you can sometimes make a bit of a guess who it was. But in this journal, we, we sent it to PLOS Biology. They they have a, a policy, I guess, where, where uh, the reviewers can choose to reveal their identity. Um, and, and in this case, they did. And one of the reviewers, I, I still, I still so starstruck over this. I can't believe they sent our paper to him. Um, is this guy called David Goodsell, who is like so, so famous for having drawn these iconic images, which uh, anyone who thinks they've never seen them, if you look at them, you'll be like, oh yeah, I've seen them. Um, he paints these amazing pictures of the inside of cells, like kind of demonstrating the crowded environment of the cell, which is like one of the main focuses of our research. Coincidentally, like we hadn't really mentioned that in the in the science arts collaboration. Um, 
but they, they sent it to, to this guy who like I don't even really think of as being a real person um but anyway he wrote like such such nice stuff I mean he gave us a lot of suggestions for how to improve our paper which we did um but I still if I ever feeling sad about something I can, can go and read that email and cheer myself right up that's amazing um, it's amazing that that sort of once you you know push on an idea on a particular idea um yeah, especially when it's an unconventional idea like this um it, it's so refreshing to find people supporting it yeah 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 he's yeah it was amazing actually it's funny because we we put this this uh, project into a competition uh, which is called falling walls i don't know if you've heard about it but it, it's a kind of festival that's commemorating the fall of the berlin wall which mm. is obviously quite a long time ago now um but they have uh, amazing stuff where they think about what is the next wall that needs to fall. It's not like a real wall, obviously. It's like all metaphorical. But they highlight all these incredible projects that are like breaking down barriers between things that you know are not normally put together. And as a result of being in that competition, like, I mean, we didn't win in the slightest, but I met the most interesting people like you think our project is unusual and cool there's I can guarantee you there's like maybe I don't know a thousand projects just as crazy and cool mm -hmm. um going on all over the world and when you meet these people it's it's so fascinating you can just I could like spend they had this thing called brain dates where it was kind of like this conversation where you sign up for different slots I, I guess it's it's like regular dating maybe but you meet people who are doing interesting projects who are interested in your project you can put like a question and if somebody wants to answer that question they can join you on a on a brain date and I, I did a few of them it was it was just non-stop fun really fantastic connections I could have done it all day every day but I, I think so. one of the fast, most fascinating things about about this experience with your art project and Generally, with your experience in in general as as a person and sort of what you've gone through since you left school, um, to now being a, a researcher, you know, breaking down barriers between between different disciplines, I think one of the most fascinating things for me is that people are actually so willing to talk to one another, but they just feel like they can't. They feel like that it's it's almost as if it's designed in a way where you're not really supposed to, but actually everybody wants to, you know, communicate and explore these ideas. Um, and so for somebody like you that's, that's gone through on this, this amazing journey, um, what kind of advice would you say to any young people, uh, whether it's a, a, a boys or girls or, you know, like um, young people, whether they're from an Orthodox Jewish environment or they're, they're from a you know uh, a very conservative muslim environment that have these sort of preset ideas about where they're supposed to go what advice would you give them oh my gosh where to start it's it's such an interesting question and i knew you were going to ask me something like this and i was trying to think about it i i think it's really hard when you're young um to step outside what you think is expected of you and um also to to be yourself as and and not feel like so so pressurized by your friends and by your um surrounding environment i have it like i have young kids myself and a lot of my friends do as well and we're always talking about you know what's best for them like what you know what's gonna keep that flame alive because they've all got so much individuality and you said something about it being kind of knocked out knocked out of you at a certain mm -hmm. age and i think you're right that that happens like i remember the first day of university um you know way back when in in the 90s i i was so clueless and and really you know i i i just felt this you know that a certain thing is expected of me i don't like quite understand what that is and you can see people sort of pairing off into their friendship groups or and and these crowds and and sort of groups forming and it's it's terrifying and you wonder like where is my place and should i be trying to get with that lot should i be trying to go in this direction i think it, it's very confusing 
um, being young, and I'm sure everyone has a different experience of, you know, which decade has worked out the best for them. Um, but I found that the more I age, the more, like, I, I'm just not scared now to be myself. Like, I know I'm not that normal, and I'm not necessarily the same as, like, a lot of people. But I think that's an advantage. So I think embracing your individuality and not letting it get, like, quashed by like some, I don't know, social ex fire extinguisher that goes around like saying everyone needs to be the same. Like, I, you know, I walk in the streets and I see groups of people together um, and when they're young, they always look the same. You know, they're wearing the same clothes or um, I, I just I, like I wish I could go back to my old self and say like one day you will be much more confident, mm -hmm. like one day. Um, you know, I have, I have a friend whose kid is like a walking encyclopedia, just loves like memorizing all these crazy facts. And she was saying, you know, I don't want him to go to blah school because I think they'll, they will make him feel weird and he'll just like forget about all that. And, you know, he'll just mm -hmm. become a, a clone. Uh, but then if he goes to this, you know, whatever, all the usual worrying that people do when they, when they have kids. But yeah, I, it's, it's, it's really hard. I think it's it's a hard thing to navigate, but I to me, like talking to as many people as you can about their journey and understanding that you can create your own niche in life. I, I think a lot of, I don't know, I, a lot of my career was, was designed based on safety. Like I knew that I needed to have my my income like I wouldn't you know like I, I think I quite really fancy getting into um, communication like tv journalism that sort of thing but I was always really terrified to do anything that was short term or you know an internship where you didn't get paid properly um or the, that sort of thing and I always went into I mean it's it's hilarious and people always laugh at me for having chosen science as a kind of safe <laughs> career but but we've already established that I wasn't like very well informed at any point <laughs> along my career journey um and and as it happens i have constantly been in work since i've left school which you know it's it's good and i've you know i've been okay in that in that respect i do sometimes dream of a gap year or a sabbatical you know something like that where mm. oh where i could just <laughs> take a little breather <laughs> but um yeah it's hard it's hard I think. It, it definitely is hard and i think also like one of the things you point to is that you know young people definitely struggle to f find you know themselves and find their comfort and you know just accept be comfortable in their own skin and i think for me personally i think what the the thing that worked for me is just exposing myself to loads of different ideas exposing myself to loads of different industries just trying things um i mean but i'm i'm a bit of a, a weirdo myself I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm too far on on the risk spectrum i'm too too high but generally like i think it's that exposure exposure whether it's, it's to people whether it's to ideas whether it's um to sort of areas that's why people go traveling to discover themselves but perhaps you don't need to go traveling for everyone some people just need to exposure to other people um, and in your case, it certainly does seem like that. So um, what is there any sort of interesting or um, striking projects that you're working on at the moment or you want to work on uh, in the future? Uh, I actually I've recently got into cryo electron microscopy, which is like so, so, so cool. Um, so I don't know if you know this history, but um, cryo electron microscopy or any kind of electron microscopy it's, it's like a I mean essentially has the effect of being an incredibly incredibly powerful microscope but it was always it was always a bit insultingly known as blobology um, as in that you could never get that much detail in what you were looking at however in the last few years it's there's been something called the resolution revolution. So um, there's been some amazing scientific advances in that field. And now you can get the most spectacularly detailed images, like atomic images. You can see like individual atoms and it is so unbelievably cool. Anyway, in my lab, we've got this, um, we've got this 
piece of machinery that um, part of it, well, part of it is, has been known for a long time. It's like a kind of waste disposal chute um, that sits inside bacteria and chews up old proteins that aren't needed. Um, but a collaborator of mine in the States, who I, I talk to every week on, on, you know, like this, like I'm talking to you, um, she, her lab discovered this like new sort of adapter that you can stick onto the machine um, that is involved in uh, a, a process that I, I probably shouldn't just start talking about now, but um, some kinds of bacteria when situations become stressful or tough or extreme, like if you're trying to clean them with disinfectant mm -hmm. or if they get into like an extreme situation, they have the ability to shut down and become spores, which are these very, very hardy, long lived um, forms of bacteria that can like last for gazillions of years and keep their genetic material and come back to life when the situation becomes favorable again. And they're a bit part of the um, C. difficile hospital superbug problem because however much you clean your hospital, you can't get rid of these spores because they're just so hardy. Anyway, the process of them like shutting themselves down involves this waste disposal machine and this new adapter that my collaborator found. Okay. And so we've um, we've found we've been looking at it by cryo electron microscopy, and we just got our first like three D reconstruction of how it looks, and it still needs loads more work. But that is is like something I have. So my lab has been inactive for about a year because of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. so different people couldn't come for different reasons, and obviously at times no one was allowed to be there. Um, so I've been so unproductive, and my kids have been at home, and it's been total chaos mm -hmm. basically. Um, but recently my postdoc went back to lab and he just got this result and like, oh my gosh, it's just made all of us so excited and happy about science again. It's really um, amazing that that sort of, you have, uh, you, you know, when you have a breakthrough like this or when you have like something that is revolutionary, that changes, it sort of gives you this charge of motivation to want to get back to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. Like, I have to say, you know, it's super tough being a student at the moment. Um, and I really feel for all our undergrads because, you know, they're meant to be having this like time of their life. And instead, they're like struggling to focus watching like a million little videos that we've all had to make, you know, at the last minute in our bedroom. <laughs> and um, it's not easy. You know, it's not easy for anyone. It's not easy for us. It's really not easy for them. And um you know, our whole year really this year has been very much focused towards like trying to make sure they're okay and like trying to make their experience not as bad as it mm. as it could be, you know, like exactly. trying to make the best of a bad job. And research has really taken a back, you know, gone on the back burner, which is frustrating because it is so, it's like, as you say, like it's the real sort of fire behind, behind what you do. But, um, you know, even just like checking in with your personal duties and like trying to check that they're like not having a nervous breakdown, like stuck with their parents when they thought they were going to be like, you know, mm. having such a good time. And it is really, it's it's really been a crazy year, but um, hopefully we're it, on the way out. Let's let's hope so. I mean, uh, fingers crossed things are, are starting to seem a little bit better. Let's hope. Um, <laughs> Rivka, where can people find you online if they wanted to sort of reach out to you or, or see what you're doing, what your latest work is? Uh, I'm very uh, active on social media. So I have, um, well, actually, I have to say, I'm, I'm not so huge on Insta. Um, I'm getting there, but it's like not so natural to me. But Twitter, I do a lot of tweeting and I really don't separate business and pleasure on Twitter. I just tweet about everything. Yeah, kind of like um, yeah most of the most of the tweets are like crazy stuff that my six-year-old kid says um but also a lot of science in there as well <laughs> and uh, um, it's at rli22 rli22 yeah <laughs> and um yeah that's probably the main thing and if, if i'm doing anything else like you know if we publish a paper or if i'm speaking somewhere or something like that i will always you know, mention it on Twitter. So probably Twitter is the best. Um, also, our, our university has web pages with our addresses. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone wants to just send an email, so I'll, I'll link. The, I'll link the profile and the and the handle so people can you know reach out to you if if they want to cool. follow you if they want to um sort of collaborate with you. Uh, Rivka, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> You're a bundle of joy, and it's been it's been it's been a, a pleasure. Cool. Thank you for watching this video. 
Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.